Dr. Melanie Joy is a Harvard-educated psychologist, professor of psychology and sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, celebrated speaker and author of the award-winning book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. Dr. Joy is the eighth recipient of the Institute of Janeology's Ahisma Award, which was previously awarded to Nelson Mandela and the Dalai Lama. Her work has been featured by numerous national and international media outlets, including the BBC, ABC Australia, NPR, and the New York Times. Dr. Joy has given her acclaimed Carnism presentation on five continents, and the video of her recent TED X talk on carnism is in the top 1% of most viewed TEDx talks of all time. She is also the founder and president of Beyond Carnism and the author of Strategic Action for Animals. And we request respectfully that there be no unauthorized filming of her presentation. Thank you. Good morning. I'm still trying to come down off of the emotion of uh, Wayne's amazing talk. This is a very, uh, this is a, a really important moment for me. Um, I don't remember, it must have been five years ago now. It's the last time I was here at Watkins Glen at the Hoedown. I gave a talk on carnism and effective vegan advocacy. And at the end of the talk, the then executive director a farm sanctuary came up to me and started talking to me and he said, what, what, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to be talking about carnism, the psychology of eating animals. I, I'd like to be able to travel and talk about that in different places in the world. And he said, well, let's see what we can do. The farm sanctuary gave me a grant and said, travel the US, see what happens. They renewed the grant the next year. And um, the talks were so popular in the US that they started to get international recognition and eventually turned into what has become a five-year international speaking tour where I've spoken, as Jane said, on five continents, 27 countries, and reached just through the talks and media related to them alone over 40 million people. And this was made possible by Farm Sanctuary. Amazing. So. So today I'm going to talk about the stories that are created by and help create the dominant animal eating culture. Now, these stories are myths, but they have a profound impact on us as vegans and also vegetarians and also on the vegan movement. Because when we believe these myths, they can cause us to feel frustrated, isolated, and hopeless and they can seriously undermine our advocacy. But when we recognize these myths for what they are, we can transform our despair into inspiration and create a much more powerful movement. Now, to understand these myths, I wanna first talk about the ideology that breeds them. Some of you are aware of my work on um, carnism, but for those of you for whom it's new, I'm just gonna briefly uh, explain this concept. Now, Many of us today still believe that there is no belief system or ideology of the dominant culture. It's like we assume that it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But the only reason that we learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, is because we do learn to follow a belief system when it comes to eating animals. So when eating animals is not a necessity, then it is a choice and choices always stem from beliefs. So carnism is the term that I use to describe the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions people to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. Now, carnism is a global phenomenon. Around the world, in meat-eating cultures, people tend to have a select group of species that they learn to classify as edible. All the rest they classify as inedible and often disgusting to consume. Carnism is also a dominant belief system or ideology that means it's woven through the very structure of society to shape norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. As Wayne pointed out, it shapes our social institutions. And it becomes internalized, shaping the very way we think and feel about eating animals. 
And of course, carnism is a violent ideology. So carnism is truly a system of oppression. However, people who participate in carnism, people who eat animals, also care about animals. And so we have this paradox, right? So carnism, like other violent ideologies, needs to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now, it does this through creating these myths, right? Carnistic defenses are essentially myths that support the ideology, because what happens is that these myths distort our perceptions, which then block our feelings, which then enable our behaviors, which then reinforce the ideology. This is supposed to be a feedback loop, but for some reason, Mac doesn't allow you to make circles with arrows. So. <laughs> Gave up trying to do that one. But here's an example of what it would look like, okay? So carnism is the ideology or the belief system. It, um, one of the myths that it teaches us is that animals are things, animals are objects, so this distorts our perceptions. So we think of a turkey, right, as someone, as something rather than someone, which then numbs our natural empathy, our natural feelings toward that turkey, which then allows us to eat turkeys, which then reinforces our belief that turkeys are meant to be eaten. Make sense? Isn't there a name used for the fictions, the myths created by the dominant culture? Isn't there a word for that? Yeah, I think so, right. Now, these myths are a part of a strategy that keeps carnism alive. Okay, what the myths do is they tell stories, right? They're stories that both strengthen carnism. For carnism to stay alive, it needs to keep itself strong. And what else? Exactly, weaken veganism. Okay, so there are two types of myths. One type strengthens carnism, the other type weakens veganism. I call these primary defenses or defense mechanisms and secondary defenses. So primary defenses t create stories that validate carnism. They tell the story that eating animals is the right thing to do. For example, there are many, many, many examples of this. Secondary defenses, on the other hand, create myths that invalidate veganism. So their story is that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. Have you heard of this book? Don't bother reading it, it's not good. It's really not good. Even if I believed it, it's not, not well written. So primary defenses distort the truth about farmed animals and also about non-vegans, right? They teach us to think animals are objects, people need to eat animals, whereas secondary defenses distort the truth about vegans and veganism, for example, vegans are unhealthy, and a lot of other myths that you may be well familiar with. Now, the main defense of carnism, we're going to talk first briefly about primary defenses, okay? The main defense of carnism is denial, and this is expressed largely through invisibility. One way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. There is no belief system. There are vegans and vegetarians, and then there's all the normal people, right? There's no belief system. It, so, I mean, if, if we don't recognize that there's a belief system, we can't even think about it. We can't even question our choice to eat animals. Eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. The other myth is that, well, there, there is no problem. What are you talking about? There's, there's, there's no mass oppression happening, you know? So carnism keeps the victims out of sight and, of course, therefore conven conveniently out of public consciousness. Now, another set of myths justify eating animals, okay? And the way we justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the facts, that the myths of eating animals are the facts of eating animals. Many of these myths f fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating animals is what? 
You've heard this all before, right? Normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, we have heard this all before over many, many years. Can you see in the back? Can you see the words? Okay. We've heard this in a variety of ways, right? And carnism uses a set of myths that distort our perceptions of meat, eggs, and dairy and the animals that we eat. So for example, we learn, as I said, to see animals as objects. We learn the myths that animals are not individuals. You know, a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. And we learn to place animals in rigid categories in our minds. Some animals we love, some animals we hate. Uh, hate, eat. That was Freudian. Um, so <laughs> I'm a psychologist, I can't help it. Now, as vegans, we often have an intuitive understanding of these primary carnistic defenses, right? Because a lot of our vegan advocacy is about telling the truth. It's about trying to, like, shine a light on the fact that these are myths. So you may have seen, you know, a, a lot of our ag advocacy is making the invisible visible. This is the Nine Billion Lives tour that Farm has, you know, pay-per-view videos. Uh, challenging categories, a mercy for animals. Um, billboard, or right here at Farm Sanctuary, validating the individuality of animals. And all of these are extremely important, you know? So, I mean, Wayne talked about the importance of direct action everywhere, and that's absolutely true. It's also true that we need to have specific forms of advocacy that really demonstrate, really target the myths and highlight the fact that these are not facts. So people come to Farm Sanctuary, they connect with the animals, they recognize that these are beings, not things. And this creates a profound, can create a profound transformation in people's minds and hearts. So as vegan advocates, we often recognize that um, non-vegans are looking at the world through the lens of carnism, right? They're looking at the lens, uh, looking at carnism through the lens of primary defenses. What we often don't recognize, however, is that we as vegans, and this is true for, for vegetarians as well, are also looking at the world through the lens of carnism. We are all born into this same culture, except that we are looking through the lens of secondary defenses. In other words, we tend to believe the myths that we hear about ourselves, our ideology, and our movement. When we believe these and internalize them, they can have a serious negative impact on us and significantly disempower us. Now, secondary defenses, as I said, invalidate the stories that challenge carnism. They exist to weaken veganism, to silence those who speak out against oppression and tell the truth. They do this by invalidating vegans as individuals, by inv invalidating vegan ideology, the belief system and the practice, and also by invalidating the vegan movement as a whole. So let's look at each of these. But before we do, I want to talk about a backlash. How many of you are familiar with this concept? Okay, a backlash is a reaction of the dominant culture when its power is threatened. And what ends up happening is the culture fights back, and it fights back in ways to try to squelch the social movement that's threatening it. So we're seeing an increase in some of the like, you know, anti-vegan stereotypes, for example. And this is because we're winning. <laughs> One example is the example of so-called happy meat. You know, I mean, so many vegans say to me, like, my God, after all of our efforts and all of the years, now we have to deal with happy meat? And I say, it's not, it's not in spite of our efforts, it's because of our efforts, okay? This is a PR campaign, this is a PR move because we're winning. Social change is like a stress, a, a stress, a, a chess game. And it's, I mean, imagine if we believed that every time our opponent, you know, moved their pawn as a defensive reaction, oh, we made a mistake, we're losing. So a backlash, secondary carnistic defenses, they evolve and intensify as the vegan movement evolves and intensifies. They're a sign of our success, not our failure. And it's really important to remember that. 
So one kind of defense is projection. Projection invalidates vegans and therefore the message. You know, if you shoot the messenger, you don't have to take seriously the implications of his or her message. It tells the story, vegans are wrong. One kind of projection has to do with the qualities of carnistic culture. So one myth is that vegans have the undesirable qualities of the dominant culture. For example, we're called biased or extremist, right? Have you ever heard this before? But we get called this when we challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. That's a projection. Or sometimes the myth tells us that vegans don't have the desirable qualities of the culture. So we might be called overly emotional or sensationalist. Have you heard this before? Just a little bit. When we challenge the apathy and the numbing of the culture. If we believe this myth, then we believe that we internalize the message that we're overly sensitive, that, that something's wrong with us because of our emotions. When it comes to animal agriculture, when it comes to animal exploitation, the world needs more emotion, not less. So, thank you. The fact is that our feelings of sadness and grief are healthy, appropriate, legitimate responses to the atrocity that is carnism. We should be proud of our sensitivity, not ashamed of it. Some myths reduce vegans to shallow stereotypes. So if we advocate peace, we're a tofu-loving, tree-hugging hippie. Nope. And there is nothing wrong with being a tofu-loving, tree-hugging hippie. Trust me. However, there is a problem with being reduced to a one-dimensional stereotype, and this we need to pay attention to. Or if we express our outrage at what's happening to the animals in the world, then we're militant human haters, right? So, <laughs> well. And we just need to remember we are more than just our ideology, just as non-vegans are more than just their ideology. Sometimes, um, you know, this, there's a projection that, you know, projects onto us that we're the all-powerful vegan. In other words, it's like we only have a right to our ideology if we can live up to an impossible ideal. So we're expected to be paragons of health. Now, I'm just curious here. Um, raise your hand if you have ever pretended that you're not sick to, no, okay, it's all, their hands are already going up, to non-vegans, because you don't want them to blame it on your, there's a diet, right? Right? Because, because like you sneezed, and it's the diet, right? But the guy next door who just had the quadruple bypass has bad genetics, go figure. And we're supposed to be paragons of virtue with like the moral consistency of the Buddha. So like, you know, we're extremists if we don't wear leather, but we're hypocrites if we do, so we can't win. Or we're expected to be experts on everything, you know, like <laughs> agricultural economics, organic, veganic, hydroponic mushroom farming, <laughs> quantum physics, like, we're not allowed to talk about the problem of carnism unless we have all the solutions to it, right? Which obviously one individual simply cannot. And we, we cannot. And then, and then when we don't have all the answers, it becomes an excuse, or when we don't live up to any of these ideals, it can become an excuse to invalidate everything that, you know, invalidate veganism, everything that we stand for. This is incredible pressure on us if we believe that we are expected, supposed to live up to this impossible ideal, we carry a heavy, heavy burden. We feel like the success or the failure of the movement is resting on our shoulders and we somehow have to be perfect vegans all the time and advocate to everybody around us and then we don't say the right thing, we say coulda, shoulda, woulda, that person's still eating cheese, but if only I had introduced them to Dea, you know, and on and on it goes. And it's exhausting. And, you know, the truth is that we, um, surprise, we're actually human. 
and we are not perfect and we're not supposed to be perfect and we need to give ourselves permission not to advocate when we don't want to advocate because burnout is a big problem in our movement and one of the reasons people burn out is because it's really hard to live in a dominant carnistic culture and have to be that vegan on all the time defending yourself advocating raising consciousness never getting mad never getting sick knowing everything oh my god yeah so take a break you know sometimes you just want to go to that dinner party and enjoy the dips and salsa and not have to talk about why you don't eat fish and that yeah fish are animals in fact and so my friend and the other author Colleen Patrick Goudreau says you know as vegans our goal should be to plant seeds that's it plant seeds you can't change people we can't make people change but we can plant seeds live your truth and ultimately practice nonviolence towards self. Pay attention to your level of uh, stress and sustainability. It's important to have a sustainable life as a vegan, as a person. A sustainable life means that you are taking into yourself, physically, emotionally, psychologically, as much as you're putting out, at least. Otherwise, it's like a bank account that eventually becomes empty. Practice nonviolence towards self and take care of yourself, and it will probably be the best investment in the animal rights movement that you can make. Now, some vegans internalize this belief that you know there that, that there there is a you know ideal that vegans can and should be perfect, right? And that their brand of veganism is the perfect ideal. And this kind of thinking leads to a fundamentalism that's really problematic in, in all social movements. So we really need to recognize that vegans are not uh, a homogeneous group. It's not a vegan is a vegan and all vegans are the same. You know, oh, you must be best friends because that person doesn't eat meat, eggs, or dairy either. <laughs> We're just as diverse as non-vegans, and we should be, and our diversity is our strength. There are different approaches to bringing about social change. There are different ways that we relate to our veganism, very different personalities, and we need this. It's really important. Members of, of uh, minority groups often, and we're an ideological minority group, often feel that like if we're not united, we're divided. But we don't have to be perfectly on board with everything all vegans say all the time. It's really okay. Now, another kind of projection projects onto us, you know, the pathologized vegan, the story, the myth, the, the myth here is that vegans are physically or mentally ill. Um, you know, <laughs> thanks to vegan activists and professionals, you know, the, the stereotype of the sickly protein deficient vegan is quickly becoming a thing of the past. But even today, it's not terribly uncommon for a young woman's choice to be vegan, for example, to be considered symptomatic of uh, an eating disorder. Pathologizing those who challenge oppressive systems is nothing new. Slaves who attempted to escape from slavery were diagnosed with the mental illness drapedomania, because you gotta be crazy if you don't wanna be slaving to white people. So it, this is a way of, again, pathologizing those who challenge the status quo is a way of discrediting their message. The truth is that veganism is generally a sign of mental health, not illness. It's a sign that someone is choosing to live in accordance with their values and to live a life of greater integrity. It's something to be celebrated, not feared. Now, just as justification is a primary defense, it's also a secondary defense. And you may have, um, remember, the three ends of justification, eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. Secondary justification tells the story, not eating animals is what? Abnormal, unnatural, and unnecessary, right? This is, again, a way of discrediting veganism, vegan ideology, right? And the way this looks is through, now we have happy meat, people who say, well, I want to do less harm, but veganism is so radical, so I'll just eat happy to be eaten animals. Now, often these are people who truly do want to make a difference and do more good, who just don't realize that eating happy animals is a myth. Or we see, um, the, you know, sustainable meat like Michael Pollan, you know. Well, veganism is unnatural, so what we should really do is eat locally sourced animals. And I know, we won't go there. 
or eating animals uh, or, or veganism. It's, it's, un, it's not necessary. What we really need to do is, I call this biocarnism, you know? So we see this expressed in like the paleo people. These are reactive belief systems to the fact that the vegan movement is becoming increasingly successful. These three newer kinds of movements are movements, in my opinion, that are emerging because we're succeeding, succeeding. And so these secondary myths are becoming stronger and more prominent. And so we come full circle to denial. As you might remember, it's the primary defense of the entire system. One story that denial tells is that there, there is no belief system. But secondary denial takes this one step further because if we believe that people who eat animals are operating outside of a belief system, and a dominant belief system at that, then we believe the myth that, well, there's no dominant group, there's no majority group. And if we believe that, what else do we believe? There is no, there's no minority group, right? There's no dominant group, there's no minority group. So, this tells the story that vegans are not an ideological minority group. This myth has real consequences for us. So raise your hand if you have ever been like teased or mocked for no, you, you know where I'm going with this already, right? Don't even finish. Well, for no reason other than the fact that you're vegan. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> there's a name for that. Um, it's prejudice, okay? This is an irrational attitude of hostility. Okay, directed against an individual or group simply because of their membership in that, in, in that particular group. Carnistic prejudice is very real and it's also very invisible. Most people who express it are, are not aware of it because carnism is still so invisible. So when we are on the receiving end of it, we can take it much more, I mean, it is personal, obviously, but it is an expression. We are consistently, as vegans, on the receiving end of carnistic prejudice. It is socially acceptable to say and do things to vegans today that would be considered unthinkable to say and do to members of other subordinated groups, or at least a number of them. And carnistic bias is woven through the very foundations of society. So when we study nutrition, for example, we actually study carnistic nutrition. Except when you talk about nutrition as a vegan, you're biased. Denial also tells the story that there's no system of oppression. There's no atrocity, okay? So one myth of secondary denial is that animal agriculture, it's just the way things are. It's not an atrocity. It's not a mass trauma or traumatization. If we believe that animal agriculture is not a trauma, a traumatization, right? Then we also believe the myth there are no victims. I mean, these animals are not victims, they're, they're, they're livestock, they're units of production. There are no perpetrators, and there are no witnesses. In any trauma, there are three roles, victim, witness, and perpetrator. Who are the witnesses? Yeah, we are. We are. So this myth, this set of myths has profound consequences on us as well. For example, raise your hand if you or anybody but, uh, that you know has experienced any of, the, any of the following things as a direct result of being vegan or, or being an activist. Depression? A little bit. Intrusive thoughts of animal suffering? Okay, like where you just, it comes into your mind during the day, you're trying to fall asleep at night. Um, nightmares about animal cruelty? How about that one? All the hands go up, yeah, a loss of faith in humanity, irritability, maybe a little bit there, feeling like your activism is never enough, feeling guilty for enjoying yourself when there's so much suffering so you stop being able to actually relax and have a good time because you say, my God, like what's happening right now, this very second, how can I possibly enjoy myself? I feel so guilty, right? And of course, burnout. I mean, this inevitably leads to burnout, right? So. When we believe these myths, when we don't recognize that we as vegans, you know, and often as activists as well, are not witnesses to suffering, then we believe the myth that activists don't suffer from secondary trauma. 
This is a myth. Secondary trauma, sometimes referred to as STSD, is like post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. The only difference is that it impacts witnesses rather than direct victims of violence. And this is a very real phenomenon. Our movement is full of walking trauma survivors, essentially, people walking around with this trauma. Now, these emotions are a normal response to witnessing an atrocity. Anybody would experience them. However, if we don't recognize them for what they are, we can't take care of ourselves and we re-expose ourselves to trauma over and over and over again. So I'm going to recommend a resource here. It's a book called Trauma Stewardship. It's written by, I don't know if the author is, an active, um, is a vegan or not. I get the sense she is from the book. But um, Trauma Stewardship is about secondary trauma, and it's a self-help book for how to prevent and treat secondary trauma if you're experiencing any of the symptoms or if you're in the movement that increases the chances you will. This is also on our website, and I'll give you the link at the end. So the fact is, trauma is a normal, natural response to witnessing violence. We don't have to experience it as problematic and getting in our way, though. And finally, when we believe that there is no system of oppression, then we also believe the myth that, that eating animals is just a matter of personal ethics. I mean, this is not terribly different than believing that owning African slaves had nothing to do with racism, right? In fact, eating animals, we, we believe that eating animals, it's not a social justice issue. And then we believe that the vegan movement, it's not a social justice movement. It's just a fringe movement of crazy animal people who don't care about humans as well. These are myths. When we recognize them, we're much more empowered to transform our relationship with them. Eating animals is not simply, I hit that by mistake, eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive system. It is a social justice issue. So, when we believe that there is no system of oppression, we believe a series of three other myths. Well, there's no vegan movement. Veganism is just a trend. You've heard this before, too. This is another myth. This is, it, veganism is not a trend. I have been around the world. I have been witnessing the rise of the vegan movement. I have never seen anything like it in my lifetime. It has been absolutely phenomenal. We believe that the movement is tiny, weak, and effective, and we also believe that we are powerless to make a difference. When we believe these myths, we believe that we are powerless, when in fact, we are not. So obviously, denial can lead to despair. When we believe these myths, we feel isolated, we feel silenced, we feel disconnected from each other and our movement. And it is a very powerful way of silencing those who would speak out against the oppression. But the good news is that when we recognize secondary defenses, we can transform our relationship with them. We can practice what I call proactive veganism rather than reactive veganism. When we, practice, when we are reactive as vegans, that means that we are believing in the myths of carnism and we are reacting in them, okay? When members of a minority group believe the negative messages they hear about themselves, that means they have internalized the oppression of the culture. It's referred to as internalized oppression. One of the consistent messages that members of minority groups, including ideological minority groups, get is that our needs are less valid and important than the needs of members of the dominant culture. So for example, have you ever been like, invited to a family dinner and you ask to like maybe keep the butter out of the mashed potatoes so that you can eat them too and somehow like you're laughing you get it right like your need to actually be able to eat is less important than the need to have a traditional me margarine won't cut it earth balance doesn't wear a traditional meal and when members of the dominant culture um, believe the messages as they hear about themselves, they've internalized the privilege of the culture. They have learned the message, well, our needs are more valid and important. So, for example, have you ever invited a non-vegan to go to a vegetarian restaurant with you and they're like, there's nothing I can eat, I mean, <laughs> right? 
but you're invited to go to a steakhouse. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else about that. And this is not to say that non-vegans are doing this intentionally. We are all part, you know, many well into, most of us were not always vegan and probably doing exactly the same things. Carnism is invisible and it socializes well-intentioned people so that they participate in these very problem, problematic dynamics. When we have internalized depression, that means we look at the world through the eyes of others and we believe their version of reality over our own. We can often feel shame. I've heard so many vegans apologize for inconveniencing people or feel embarrassed for being so sensitive and so reactive and they're like being teased and they're upset. Of course they're gonna be upset. There's a lot of shame um, in the movement. And this is largely to do with the fact that we have internalized the negative messages, the myths that are not true about ourselves and our movement. When we practice proactive veganism, however, we can approach situations with a more open mind, curiosity, and compassion. Most importantly, we can transform our shame to pride. Pride is feeling fundamentally good about who we are. And pride is a prerequisite or a requisite for all social movements. I mean, we have had black pride, for example. We've got gay pride. And now we've got veggie pride happening all over the world. And we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot to be proud of. So ultimately, when we recognize the carnistic myths, we, we don't underestimate their power. We don't underestimate their power. As a powerful man once said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. But we also, so we don't underestimate their power, I should say, but we also don't overestimate their power. Because as an even more powerful man once said, all through history, the way of truth has always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always. <laughs> and perhaps the greatest myth of all is the story that people don't care. It is the myth that people eat animals not because their hearts and minds have been manipulated by an invisible system that's outside of their awareness, but because they simply don't care. And I can assure you that this is a lie. People care. I have had the privilege of speaking to thousands and thousands of meat eaters all around the world. My talks are designed for, for meat eaters. I have spoken to large audiences, as I said, in five continents and everywhere I go. I see the same thing, people care. And I'm gonna share with you just a few of the, um, some select feedback that I've gotten. I give evaluation forms after I give a talk. Um, and I'm just gonna share with you a few of the responses that I've gotten over the years. Can you see in the back or should I read it out? Read it, they're saying in the front, read it, and they're saying in the back, I, we can see. So I'll read it. This is from Bellevue, Washington. My life changed tonight. I cracked open. My heart cracked open. I'll never have a bite of animal flesh ever again. Again, ever. This is from Zagreb, Croatia. I wasn't vegan before. Now I really should be. You were successful. Thank you. From Albuquerque, New Mexico, I can't make excuses anymore. Thank you for making the visible, invisible, visible. <laughs> From Marabor, Slovenia, my values and sense of myself are different than following this belief system. Definitely, I have to make some changes, definitely. <laughs> From Stockholm, Sweden, I now see how we are all really just under a sort of group pressure. Now I have real doubts about ever eating meat again. And finally, from San Francisco, California, I came to this presentation very skeptical and thinking I might leave unchanged, but I feel, I feel extremely aware and changed. 
And these are, I mean, these are just a tiny, tiny selection of, of hundreds, thousands of, of pieces of feedback that only I have gotten. And many of these people, many of you in the room are hearing similar things from the people in your life, no doubt. So despite what the carnistic fictions would have us to believe, there is reason to be very, very hopeful. Because the vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is one of the fastest growing social justice movements in the world today. It is amazing. And I have seen and met with leaders from the movement all over the world, and people are just doing tremendous things. We've got direct action everywhere. We've got organizations that are normalizing veganism by getting vegan products into the stores. We've got sanctuaries that are individualizing animals, artists that are publishing, you know, musicians that are singing about this. It's just there's a diversity of approaches that are happening that are changing the world, and it's just amazing to see. So, so remember that you are making a difference. Each and every one of you. I mean, that you are the reason that the animal situation is not worse. So do not allow carnistic culture to, to, to minimize your belief in your, in your own impact. You are the reason that we have hope today. And remember that you are a part of a social movement. You are part of something greater. We are all a part of something greater than our individual selves. We are part of a social movement that I believe will be looked back upon one day as one of the most important and transformational, if not the most important and transformational social movements in history. It's amazing to see. So I want to just wrap up by thanking you. You know, you're, the fact is that we are succeeding. And for thanking you um, for doing what you do, it is not easy to live in a dominant carnistic culture where every day our deepest sensibilities are offended. You know, we really are. This movement is young, but it's growing quickly. And we are all pioneers. And it takes a tremendous amount of courage and commitment to maintain our values and to live live what live our truth and speak our truth truth in, in, in the face of overwhelming pressure to conform to the carnistic majority. So I want to just like thank you for having the truth to speak, having the courage to speak truth to power. It's through your stories that I get my greatest inspiration. So I want to thank you for empowering me to continue doing what I'm doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, if you'd like any more information, resources we have for vegans, vegetarians, anybody on the carnistic continuum, please visit us at, at, at carnism.org. And we also have sign-up sheets if you'd like to get on our mailing list that I believe are being circulated around. <laughs>